All right, take your Bibles, please. Turn over to the book of Luke, chapter number 11. Thank you, Brother Dirksen. Mrs. Shipley had to go home. She wasn't feeling good, and she was going to do the special, but Brother Dirksen was willing to step in and sing, and he did all, he did all right, you know. I got I to gotta work with him some more. Teach him. <laughs> no, that was great. Love that song. My goodness. Make you want, makes you want to jump out of your skin sometime, doesn't it? All right, hey. Would you would please, if you would, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 11, we'll begin reading here in, oh, I'm sorry, let me get that. All right, Luke chapter 11, verse number 1, please. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. John also taught his disciples he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord Jesus, thank you for teaching us to pray. Thank you for these, these beautiful words that have given us a, a beautiful outline that, Lord, we can come to you and, and accomplish something and see things happen, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of others. So please, Lord, uh, help me tonight as we continue in learning how to walk with God Lord, may that be the longing of our heart to know Thee, Lord, and to, uh, like that song says, nearer, nearer, nearer to Thee, Lord, nearer to the heart of God. And that's where we all want to live, I believe. And so help us, Lord, to live under the shadow of Thy wings in that secret place of the Most High. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. You may be seated. All right, so we are learning how to walk with God, and we are looking at the aspect of that sermon. We talked about reading the Word of God. We talked about recording what God gives to you, teaches you as you read your Bible. Now we are in the requesting, the actual time that we pray and we seek the Lord. Uh, the Bible is a time that God can speak to us. Prayer is a time that we can speak with God. Our walk with God is a daily time that we spend with God in the Bible and prayer to get to know God better. And that's a walk with God. I believe if you do those two things in the beginning of the day, I believe as a, as a song and poem says, you can have God all day long with you. But you've got to start it out with God. And that certainly is so greatly needed in our life. So, we are on number three. The first one, as Jesus taught us, and again, let me remind you, this is not, um, I am not trying to be dogmatic here. I am not saying do it this way, you're not doing it the right way. I am not saying that at all. Uh, Brother Tudor, there are others here, many of you, most of you more than likely, you already have a way that you pray, and certainly you have a, 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 an outline, a plan that you put together, Maybe for years you've been using it, and that is just fine. I am just giving to you what I believe Jesus said, this is how to do it. When they asked him to pray, he said, this is in this manner, pray ye. He said, with this outline, with this plan, this is how I want you to pray. And, and I'm going to tell you, even in my own prayer life, 43 years, um, this has been progression for me. I've learned and added to this thing and, and made it and fine-tuned it and still am learning all the time how to better pray. And you ought to always be wanting to learn more about prayer. Amen? You know, you need to be reading books. You ought to be reading books. And, and there are certain subjects you ought to constantly be reading. I think you ought to be constantly reading about the subject of prayer. I think you ought to be reading uh, about the thing of holiness and, and Christian character. So many great books out there. Reading about marriage and reading about child. I still read books about child rearing. And I'm always looking, I have three, four, five books I'm reading at the same time. I find that if I do that, sometimes I'm reading a book and I lose interest and I pick up another one, my interest is perked up again. So always be reading. Uh, what do they say? Readers are leaders. 
and you need to be a reader, and certainly one of the areas you ought to be reading about all the time is this thing of prayer. So we're looking at the outline that Jesus said, to t teaching them to pray. The first thing that you start with, you should start with, and I think I can be dogmatic here, is you ought to start with thanksgiving and praise. I, go back, you know what, what is a wonderful thing? Go back to the Old Testament where there's so many prayers. And if you'll study the prayers of the Old Testament saints, you will find every single one of them started off praising God. Amen? They started praising the Lord, thanking the Lord, calling out His name, telling Him how great He is, how wonderful He is. The book of Psalms, same way. Man, David was depressed and discouraged. He'd start out praising God and praying to God. By the end of the psalm, he's right back up again. Amen? David learned to encourage himself in the Lord, and he did it through prayer. And he started it with praise and thanksgiving. So take time to thank God for what he has done. Praise God for who he is. Vital, 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 vital. Some said you're warming up God. I don't know about that. I don't think God needs to be warmed up. I think he's pretty warm. Amen. I think he's already hot, actually. And so, but you need that for your own heart. That'll warm your heart up. Number two, number two, then in my outline, and you do it the way you want to do it, but the second thing I do in my prayer time is the confession of sin. Confess sin. Now, it's taken out of order. Jesus did it down the road a little bit. But for me, what works for me, what moves me, is after I praise God, thank God, and I do that, I begin recognizing for who He is, and I begin to see Him in the light of the Word of God and light of my heart, and all of a sudden, God begins to reveal to me the things that are wrong in my heart, and I confess sin. Do you say, do you confess sin every day? Absolutely. Every single day. I'm sorry, but I cannot start a day without thinking back on the day before. And I, I did something wrong. You know, and I talked about the sins of omission and the sins of commission. It's not always the sins of commission. It's not that I went out and did something, but I omitted things. And uh, maybe it's, and I've said it so many times, I just don't love you, Lord. God, you love me exactly the way you ought to love me. You always love me, unconditionally love me. But, Lord, I am so sorry. Forgive me. I don't love you as much as I ought to love you. Almost every day I tell the Lord that. Lord, I want to love you more. I want more love in my heart to give back to you. Uh, may, and commit uh, uh, the sins of commission, uh, sometimes it's uh, covetousness. I, I saw something somebody had. Now you think you're being, I'm being picky, but I'm sorry. Sometimes I, I get covetous. And I, I see something, I, and I really think about it. I think, man, I wish I had that. I, I, w I want that. Do you ever do that? Yeah. Did you know that's sin? Yeah. And, and sometimes I'll say, Lord, forgive me for being covetous. Forgive me, Lord, for being discontent with what I have. Sometimes I sit down and I start thinking, man, I, I wish I had this, I wish I had that. That's discontentment. That's sin. And so again, you, sometimes I confess, Lord, forgive me for being self-reliant. Forgive me for self-sufficiency. Forgive me for being selfish. For being selfish. For, I knew there was a need and I didn't do anything about it. Or I did something about it, but I didn't have the right attitude when I did it. You see what I'm saying? You're not as good as you think you are, friend. Amen? None of us are. So, again, I, I, I believe with all my heart there has to be confession of sin. He put it in there. He must want us to do it. And we must need it because this is a daily prayer that we need to do. So, confession of sin. Number three, let's get into this. Number three, so the third thing now in your outline of praying is pray for the coming of God's kingdom. Pray for the coming of God's kingdom. What does he say? He says, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. So we are starting our walk with him in prayer. We're, we're continuing in that. And, and remember, the first part of this outline, it talks about God's concerns. It talks about what God cares about. And one of the things that God most definitely cares about, he cares about his kingdom. And he wants his kingdom to be furthered. 
He doesn't want it to stagnate. He wants it to be furthered, and he wants it to be established on this earth. So, it, it, again, it, this is what I do. You don't have to do this, but I've, I've come to the place where I've broke, broken that down into two parts. The first part is when he says, thy kingdom come, I believe that's referring to when the trump shall sound and the archangel shall shout and the Lord Jesus Christ will come and take us back and we will be caught up together in the clouds. Amen? Talking about the rapture. I think that's, you ought to pray that every day. Pray for the coming of the Lord. Man, that's what God wants us to do. Some, we've been talking about Enoch walking with God. And he's been our example many times through the series of messages. Some say that Enoch being taken up into heaven is a picture of the rapture of the church. And I believe that it is. That taken up, that was Enoch. And what a glorious thing it is going to be, friends. When Jesus comes, Christ returns and rules on this earth. Somebody say amen. amen. He, and Republicans will never have anybody like him. Democrats will never have anybody like him. Independents will never have anybody like him. There's nobody like Jesus. The Bible says in Isaiah 9, 6, the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful and Counselor. By the way, that's what everybody will be calling him in his kingdom. Jesus, you're wonderful. You're counselor. You're the mighty God. You're the everlasting Father. You are the Prince of Peace. And mark it down. There will never be peace on this earth until Jesus comes. Never will be. Isaiah 2, 4. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war. Listen, any more. No more war. What a glorious kingdom that will be. That's why David taught us that we ought to be praying. Psalms 122 verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Why? He says, they shall prosper that love thee. Why, why do we want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Because the only way peace will ever come to Jerusalem is when Jesus returns. So when you are praying for the peace, and you should pray those words. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. What you're saying is, even so, Lord Jesus, come. You're asking for the coming of the Lord. That's why the last prayer in the Bible is Revelation 22, 20. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. So that's, and that's what I do. Every morning, Lord, even so, Lord Jesus, I got my office back there, windows open, clouds are up there, and I look out there and I say, Lord Jesus, come back today, please. Oh, I'd love for you to come today. But I believe there's a second part to that. And I believe the second part, when he says, thy kingdom come, it refers also to the furtherance of his kingdom till he comes. See, we're not supposed to be waiting for the kingdom of God to be established till he comes. No, sir. Uh, we need to be working at furthering the kingdom while we are here and we are waiting for him. That's why, that's why Jesus said, occupy till I come. And the word occupy means uh, keep busy. Get busy. And as ladies, he's not talking about washing dishes. Guys, he's not talking about baling hay or feeding the cows or fixing the truck. No, sir, he's talking about busy furthering the kingdom of God. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Look at Luke chapter 17 and verse number 20. See, people thought, they thought uh, that the Pharisees and even some of his first Followers thought that when Jesus came, when the Messiah came, that he was going to establish his kingdom. That meant that he was going to overrule Rome, and Rome was going to be taken down, and Israel will be once again will rule. But that's not what he was talking about. And the Pharisees thought that. And so look at Luke chapter 17 and verse number 20. It says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo, here, 
or lo there. Or you see it's over there. Or, or it's over, the, over it's over there. No. He said, for behold, look what he said. He said, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, first of all, when he says that to the Pharisees, he doesn't mean the kingdom of God is within them because they are not saved. The word within there means is in the midst of you. He says the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Of course, who is he talking about? Himself. He's talking about himself. He says you're looking for the kingdom of God to be built out there. And again, they just wanted Rome to be taken down. And again, like David and Solomon and the, and the kings of past, they to come up and be in charge again. But that is not what the kingdom of God is about. And Jesus said, no, the kingdom of God is right here in the midst of you. I'm here. I am the kingdom of God. Which means... When you and I accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, can I remind you that when you got him in you, you got the kingdom of God in you. The kingdom of God's in you. It's in you. So when you are praying, you say, Lord Jesus, even so come. Lord, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I long for you to come. I can't wait for you to build, establish your government and your kingdom on this earth. What a wonderful thing that will be. But then... You realize, but if you don't come, Lord, and if you tarry your coming, then, Lord, further your kingdom in me. Because you have Jesus in you, right? And, and he is the kingdom of God. And so your prayer ought to be every day, Lord, I want to see the kingdom of God furthered in my life. I want to be the kingdom of God. I want people to see the kingdom of God in my life. What did Jesus say in Matthew 6, He said, seek ye first the what? Kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Brother Ray did a wonderful job of teaching us that. But listen to me. Your desire as a child of God every day ought to be that, Lord, I want to see your kingdom further than my life. I want in everything I do, I want to seek first the kingdom of God. Lord, I want this to be the rule of my life today, that whatever I do, I'm thinking about furthering the kingdom of God. I'm thinking about uh, uh, furthering the righteousness of God in my life and through my life. I'm thinking about the fact, and by the way, what's the best way to do that? Is say, king of my life, I crown thee now. Thine will the glory be. So when you're saying, Lord Jesus, I want you to come and establish your kingdom, but Jesus, if you don't come today and you, and you tarry your coming, then Lord, use me. Further your kingdom in my life and through my life. You all getting that? You ought to pray that every day. God, I want to I be a picture of the kingdom of God. I want my life. To emulate the kingdom of God. So your desire should be for your life to be used. So you want to be, see the kingdom of God working in your life, but then you want your life to further the kingdom of God. That means help people get saved. That means serve the Lord. Do things for the Lord. Get involved in your church. Go soul winning. Pass out tracts. Work a bus route. Teach a Sunday school class. What are we all doing? We're all trying to further and build up the kingdom of God. And I tell Lord, and I don't want to ever tear down the kingdom of God. Some Christians tear down the kingdom of God because of the way they, they act or they don't act. I've often said, I don't ever want to be the problem. I want to be the solution. I want to be the solution. So your prayer should be, Lord, further the kingdom of God. Help me to build the kingdom of God. Use my life. Help me to make a difference today. Let my life influence people for the kingdom of God. Man, every time, every Sunday morning I say, God, use me to further your kingdom at Faith Baptist Church. To further your kingdom. To build the kingdom of God. To make a difference. We should put in the action what Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use. And prepared unto every good work. So the idea of when you pray, thy kingdom come, you're saying, not only Lord Jesus, I want you to come, but if you're way, then I want to be used to further that kingdom, to be used for you, uh, to occupy, as I said, till you come. 
help me, Lord. Help me to uh, fight the good fight. Lord, help me to finish my course. Lord, help me to, to keep the faith. Help me to, help me to finish strong. Amen. Our text says we should set apart our lives to be useful to God for a special purpose, for every good work. So, number one, number one, we start off our prayer time with thanksgiving and praise. Number two, we, we go confess our sin. At least that's what I do, but you need to have confession of sin somewhere in your prayer time. And then number three, we pray for the kingdom of God to be furthered be it with Jesus just coming back and taking us out and starting those that, that day when Jesus comes and takes us out, begins the day of the Lord, amen, and the seven years of tribulation are going to come, and then after that, Jesus is going to come back, and we get to come back with him, amen, and then he will establish his kingdom. I, I'd be happy if it happened after this message, amen. Let me finish the message, Lord, amen. And then come back, Lord Jesus, absolutely. But if he doesn't come back, Lord, let me build the kingdom of God. Use me to further the kingdom of God. Let my life make a difference for your kingdom. Amen. You don't have to be a preacher to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Anybody can make a difference if you want it to happen. And you've got to pray. You have not because you ask not. That's what Jesus said we should be praying. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Amen. Number four. Lastly, number four. Pray for God's will. Pray for God's will. Do you pray for God's will every day? God's will. Look what he says. Thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. <laughs> you know, Mel, did Mel tell you about that? Oh, Mel is his friend of Brother Bill's, friend of mine too, and he comes by the church every once in a while. Brother Bill's been working him for years, and he's a, he's a dear man, but he needs to be saved. And he's a dear man. He really is. He's a blessing. And um, he was looking out here, and uh, uh, how, let's see, how, how did he say it? He said, hey, that's wrong on the on the, uh, the Lord's Prayer. I think it's over here. He said, that's wrong. It says, uh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, something like that. He said it like that. He said, it's supposed to say, on earth, that's wrong. And I said, what? And I looked out there, and, and it said, no, it said, in earth. But it's supposed to be on earth, is what he said. And can I be very honest with you? I always pray, thy will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. That's, that's how I will pray and add to it, of course. And so I said, it is. And I was all like, oh, my goodness, we've got the wrong version up there. I did. I said, are you, are you kidding me? And so, and so I, I, I went out and I looked at it. I said, well, I'm going to check that out and open up my good old King James Bible. And I looked at him. I said, that's right. I'm wrong. It says in earth. That means on earth. And it's just, it just a little, you know, you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> well, it's just one little, what's that called? A preposition? It's a one little preposition. But I know it's important, but I guess what I'm trying to say is even Mel noticed that. Mel's unsaved, but he does understand that as a Christian, did you know the world has a higher standard for us than sometimes that we do? Did you know that? Well, you know, they, when they sometimes, and they won't always say it, when they see a Christian do something wrong, they might say, well, he's a Christian. He ought not be doing that. The world does that all the time. My brother-in-law, Al, who comes here, they come every year now, and of course he's saved, and my, daughter, my sister's saved. But, man, for years, he would not get saved. One of the reasons why he worked with a Christian as a car dealer, uh, and he lied all the time and misled people. I remember he would say, I, just, I, I don't want to be something where, where you're really not doing what you ought to do as a Christian. And that held him back for a long time, but he finally got saved. But the truth is, is the world out there has a good idea what a Christian is supposed to be and what a Christian is supposed to do. And that world out there does understand that as a child of God, it should be your burning desire and my burning desire to do the will of God. To do the will of God. That's what we should want. And, and, and again, I remind you, this purpose in walking with God, especially in prayer, is to glorify God. That's why Jesus starts out with everything about concerning 
God, to be a trophy of His grace so the world can behold what God is doing in our life. And to this point, we're, what we're doing is we're asking God to accomplish the things that He cares about. That's important to Him. Now, praise the Lord. He's going to give us time to pray for ourselves and, 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 and things that we need to do. But right now, he's, He is teaching us here that there are things that He's concerned What is He concerned about? He's concerned about praising Him. Amen? Hallowed be thy name. He said, praise, praise him. He's concerned about his kingdom, and he's concerned about his will. He did not save us to do our will. He saved us to do his will. You are not your own. I am not my own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit. That is the will of God. Robert Law said prayer is a mighty instrument, not for getting man's will done in heaven, but for getting God's will on earth. That's what prayer is about. Praying for God's kingdom to be furthered. Praying for the will of God to be done, to be ruled. And really, when you think about it, this prayer and the prayer before, it's basically they work together. Because when you're praying for God's will, you're praying for God to rule your life. That's what you're praying for. God, rule my life. Your will, not mine. Lord, your will. What do you want today? I've got my plans. There are things I want to accomplish today, but Lord, your will should usurp everything else that I desire to do today. I'm here to get your will done on this earth. Again, do you pray that? Do you pray every day thy will be done? If you don't, you should be. You should be. Oh my, there are many verses teach about the importance of God's will in our lives. Ephesians 6 says, says, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. That's my son's life verse. Doing the will of God from the heart. Will of God is, is to be the focus of our heart even on a secular job. You say, well, I'm not a preacher. I, I don't work for the church. I'm not a full-time uh, 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 servant of God in a church or something. No, the will of God has to do with everything you do in your life. He's saying here that when you're at a job, it's a secular job, that you ought to do, go there working and doing the will of God from your heart. What's he mean? He means working hard. Christian ought to go to a job and work hard. Work faithfully. Work submissively. I can take over to Colossians where it says, if you, and people have said, what if my boss cusses and my boss is this and my boss is that? Take over to Colossians. I said, even if your boss is, is wicked, you submit to him. Not to do anything wicked, but if that boss tells you to do something, you do it. Because that's the will of God. And you ought to do it from your heart. You ought to work for a secular job as if Jesus was your boss. And he is your boss according to the scriptures. He is your boss. He's the one that you're trying to please, not the boss. And God has a special reward for that secular man or that secular woman that, uh, that's working at a secular job, rather, that Christian man or that Christian woman that's working at a secular job. God says there's a reward for you if you do the will of God from your heart. Have a good attitude, amen? Man, I've, I haven't said this in a long time. I envy people that get to work in a secular world. God, here's why. You have such a wonderful opportunity to touch people's lives and influence people's lives. I, I, there's a part of me, though I love what I do, I absolutely love it. I get to work with Brother Lislin. I get to work with my daughter. I get to work with Mrs. Lislin. I get to work with some of the most wonderful Christians I know on this planet. But I also miss working at a secular job, being able to have an influence on unsaved people. I miss that. I miss living the Christian life and letting my light so shine before men that they see my good works and they glorify my Father, which is in heaven. Amen? It's wonderful when you get to lead some of the Lord that you've been working with for a while because of, because of the way you've treated them and the way you've treated others and the way you've worked and the attitudes you've had and the spirit you've shown. This, this thing of prayer is so vital. And so how are we going to do this? Well, you, you ought to pray. 
Lord, thy will be done. Help me, to do, help me, Lord, to do the will of God from my heart today. And I'm going to a job, or I'm going to have to be around some folks that they're just not, they, 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 they get to me, Lord. But, Lord, help me to do your will from my heart. Or, or 1 John 2, 17, I love this. It's one of my favorite. It says, and the world passes the way, and the lusts thereof. But listen, but he that doeth the will of God, what? Abideth forever. Uh, forever. You know, there are people that invest in so many things, and, 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 I, and I feel bad for them in a sense because they're investing in things that aren't going to last. I, I, I want to invest my life in something that's going to last forever, that's going to, that's going to bring treasures up in heaven. Now, you know, men have to work in jobs that are not going to be uh, uh, spiritual things. But the attitude is I ought to be wanting to, with my life, if I was a farmer, with my life, I can still do the will of God and abide forever with what I do and serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. The will of God. The idea being it is better to invest your life into that which, is, which cannot be lost and will forever last, which is the will of God. Now, I said I pro I'm progressing all the time in this, in this outline and adding and working with it all the time. I found through, through the years there are verses that I use in praying for the will of God. I don't use them all all the time. Every once in a while the Holy Spirit will lead me to pray this one or pray this one or use this one. So let me give you three things. Number one, number one, here we go. Number one, work in me, work in me. Look at Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. I love this verse. Look at Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. So we're, we're praying for the will of God. I'm just giving you some thoughts here. You, you take what you want to take. It's like, what do they call that place you go to? A cafeteria? And you're going through, and they got green beans and carrots and broccoli. And you're thinking, you know, uh, I'll think I'll take the green beans. Amen? But I don't want the broccoli and the carrots. So take what you want. Amen? But just don't spit on anything. Amen. Philippians 2, 13. For it is, and this is a great verse. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So to will, so I see two ways God works in me regarding the will of God. And sometimes I pray this. Sometimes, Lord, work in me to will and to do of your good pleasure. To will. What does that mean, to will? To will means to desire or to delight, to be glad. Oh, gosh, you. Probably wrong. It's probably wrong anyways. <laughs> Please listen to me. <laughs> to delight. You know what David said in Psalms 40 verse 8? I delight to do thy will. Oh my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. I don't know about you, but sometimes I pray, Lord, help me to delight in doing. Sometimes the will of God's hard. Sometimes it's hard. You know this is what I'm supposed to do. You know what you, do, you need to do, but you're just, there's a part of you that want to do it. And so the, when I come, this is my verse right here, Bonnie. Lord, give me the will. Give me the desire. Help me delight. Why would anybody want to do the will of God and not enjoy it? And I know people that have done that. Delight, delight. Lord, work in me to will. Give me the delight. Give me the joy, the gladness. Man, you read Christian biographies and you read martyrs and the, the things they went through, nothing, none of us will ever go through what most of them went through. And yet, you know what? They delighted in the will of God. They delighted. They knew they were going to be martyred. They knew they were going to be beheaded. They knew they were going to be tied to a stake and burned, but yet they delighted in it. And so sometimes that's what you have to pray. Lord, I, uh, help me to delight in the will of God. Then he says to do, to do. Work in me to will and to do of his good pleasure. To, to be active, effectu effectual, fervent. It implies having power to do it. That's where grace comes in. You might Listen, you might be struggling in your marriage. You might be struggling with your children. You might be struggling with somebody that you work with. And you're struggling with doing the will of God. So Lord, work in me to will. Give me the delight. Give me the desire. Give me the joy. Give me the gladness. And then Lord, give me the strength. Give to me the grace to do this thing. To do what you want me to do. I don't have it in me, God. I need it from you to do it. 
And everybody's going to have times in the will. If you've never had, then you haven't been doing the will of God probably. Because the will of God is so often hard. But work in me to will and to do. That's what grace is for. I've often said one of my favorite definitions of the word grace is the power to do the will of God. And Paul of course, in that great verse I've quoted so many times to you already, when he talks about I am what I am by the grace of God, at the end of it, said, it wasn't me. He said, but the grace of God which was with me. Boy, that, doesn't that just make you goosebumps up and down your back? Paul did amazing things. Greatest Christian probably ever, ever lived. Greatest church builder ever lived. Greatest missionary that ever lived. But he said, it wasn't me. It was the grace of God that was with me. Amen. Spurgeon said this, Grace all-sufficient dwells in you, believer. There is a living well within you springing up. Use the bucket. Then keep drawing. You will never exhaust it. There is a living source within you. It is called grace. Number two, number two, teach me. Sometimes I need, I don't know what to do. And so turn over to Psalms 143, verse 10. Sometimes I don't know what to do. So look at Psalms 143, verse 10. Everybody doing okay? It's only five minutes till seven. Praise the Lord. Look, this is so good. I'm so excited teaching you this. I love it. I'm like a baby in a candy store. Kid in a candy store, not a baby. Kid in a candy store. Amen. This is fun for me. I'm like, I get to share some of my blessed joys in my life. Look what it says. Psalms 143, 10. Teach me to do thy will. Look, look, for thou art my what? My God. Look what he said. Thy spirit is what? Good. And then lead me into the land of uprightness. You've heard me quote many of these verses over and over again because they're such a part of my heart and life. This is a prayer for something specific, presently happening in your life. This might be a verse that you would use concerning the will of God in an emergency. Has anybody been in an emergency and you're thinking, I don't know what to do? Anybody been there? Sure, we all have. This is the verse. This is the verse. This is the prayer. Lord, teach me. Teach me to do thy will. And why? Because he wants to lead me in the land of uprightness. He wants to lead me in the path that is his path and his plan. Because if I do it his way and go his direction, it'll be the land of uprightness. Amen. It'll be a blessed place for me to be. Why? Two reasons he gives for asking this. First of all, he says, for thou art my God. This is why I'm asking. You're my God. We have every right to go to God and say, Lord, teach me the will of God. I've never believed, I've never believed that God is trying to hide anything from us in regards to the will of God. I think we don't ask enough. I think we are, we are not as right in our heart as we need to be. The vision is clear for the pure of heart. If your heart is pure, and I'm not going perfect, but you, but you have fessed up and you, and you know, boy, you, you, you're trying to get everything right and doing it right and praying and asking God to forgive you for this and doing this right. Boy, if you do that and then you say, Lord, now teach me. And this is why every day you ought to do, confess sin and then thy kingdom come and then, Lord, now t- thy will be done. Teach me. Teach me to do that. You're my God. And then we ought to expect God. He's our God. He created the heavens and the earth. Man, we've got this book that Brother uh, Lislin and Brother Zuber recommended to me. It's called Physical Evidence. And man, every devotion, every day is about creation and the magnificence of it. Man, I shout every morning. It's, It's amazing what God has done. How in the world can anybody think this all just happened? And after I'm done reading that thing, I'm thinking, Lord, you're my God. Lord, you know what's happened. You know what the needs are. Teach me to do thy will. You're my God. And then then thy spirit is good. How does the will of God get acknowledged in our heart and our mind? Through the spirit of God. David said, Lord, your spirit is good. Now, here's the thing. David, the spirit of God kind of went in and out out of David. We have him all the time. He can't leave us. Though I imagine there's sometimes he might want to. But, but he's there. He, we're sealed. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. 
But here's what I'm saying. David knew he was good. And he had kind of in and out. But listen to me. We always have them. Man, we ought to know how good the Holy Spirit is. And so when we pray, we say, Lord, teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy, your spirit is good, Lord. He knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. Help me. Lead me. Thy spirit is good. And then number three. Number three. We're almost done. Oh, three minutes till. Look at that. Number three. Fill me. Oh, fill me. Go to Colossians chapter 1, verse number 9. Again, you may not use these verses all the time. These are verses that you may need sometimes, and you're seeking the will of God, and it may be you just haven't enjoyed the will of God. You're going through some tough time. Lord, work in me to will and to do of your good pleasure. Maybe you don't know what to do. Something's happening, and you need direction. Lord, teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Or then maybe you just... You just want to be filled with the will of God. You want to be controlled by the will of God every day. Look what he says in Colossians 1 9. For this cause, Paul is praying this for the Colossi Christians. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, did not, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now, look, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, that was Paul's prayer for the Colossi church, Colossi Christians but that ought to be our prayer for ourselves. We ought to be praying. We ought to be praying for God to give us the knowledge of his will, to be taught it, and it to be revealed to us. And how sad when a Christian knows God's will, but he does not do that. To be controlled. The word filled, like we, the Bible says, to be filled with the Spirit. All that means is to be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. And so when we, when we, Pray. Maybe we need to say, Lord, fill me, control me, control my life today. I want, I want to do everything in your will. Fill me with the knowledge of your will. And then he says here, with, with wisdom. Notice he says, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Did you know wisdom is the principal thing? Therefore, with all thy getting, get wisdom. That's what Solomon taught us to do. Get wisdom. You need to get wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to to know the will of God, but how to do it, how, how to apply it in your life. Uh, uh, Ephesians 5.15, See then that ye walk circumspectly, carefully, not as fools, but as wise. And then verse 17, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Somebody said this, Wisdom is the power to see and understand the inclination to choose the best and highest goal together with the surest means of attaining. You need both. Wisdom and understanding. So maybe that's what you need to pray. But somewhere in your prayer time, you need to pray for God's kingdom to come. You need to pray for that every day. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. And you need to pray for the king. If and, if and Lord, if you're not going to come today, then further the kingdom of God in me. And use me to, to build the kingdom of God out. Help me to keep it going. Make a difference for the, for the work of God. And then pray, Lord, now, Lord, thy will be done. Not mine. You rule my life today, Lord. And sometimes maybe this is where uh, uh, Romans chapter 12 could come in. Maybe this is where you might say, Lord, uh, I present myself as a living sacrifice unto you. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Prayer sounds like a fun time, doesn't it? It's an awesome time. To give yourself to the Lord. By the way, why does God want us to do his will and be filled with the knowledge of his will, with all wisdom and spiritual understanding? Why? Well, the next verse tells us. If you're still there, look at verse number 10. Look at it. That she might walk what? It's all about the Lord. Amen. That's why I want to be filled with the knowledge of his will. I want to walk worthy of the Lord. Unto all please. I want to please the Lord. If I, don't do, my, if I do my will and then I'm not pleasing God. I'm not pleasing God. You're not pleasing. Teenager, you do your will. You're not pleasing God. Single person, if you're, not, if you're doing your will, you are not pleasing God. It may be and making money and this and that. But if it's not what God wants you to do, I'm sorry. God's not pleased with that. He's not pleased. But look what he says. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Listen. 
when you stop doing the will of God, here's what's going to start happening. You're going to stop getting the knowledge of Him. God stops giving the knowledge. But when you're the kind of Christian you're praying, confessing, you're praising, you're thanking, you're seeking the, the coming of the Lord, you're praying for the will of God. You know what God does? God just keeps giving you knowledge and wisdom understand it. He just keeps filling you and filling you and filling. You say, well, how do some people come up with all this stuff? Amen? Because they're doing the will of God. And they're praying for wisdom and understanding. God says, you took that and you used it and you ran with it. I'll, I'll give you something else. I'll give you something else. But when you stop doing the will of God, God stops. He stops working in you and through you. You should be praying for God's will in every area of your life. When you do that, you are acknowledging two things. Number one, His authority in your life, and that you realize His plan for your life is the very best. And by the way, it is the very best. It's the best. No, there is no better, no safer place in the world, of, in the world than in the center of God's will. Oh, my. The old Puritan preacher, John Baxter, great, great man. Really, John Baxter is the reason why we have bookstores. Did you know that? John Baxter wrote a couple hundred books. He went around selling those books. He's the first man that really started writing books and selling them. What a great, great man he was. He said this, whenever somebody would buy one of his books and bring that book to him to sign it, he always wrote this in that book. Lord, what thou wilt, where thou wilt, when thou wilt. In other words, Lord, wherever you want, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, whenever you want me to do it, that's what I want for my life. I hope you're seeing your walk with God is, is a huge thing. I hope you're seeing that that morning time that you get up and you read and you record and you request that this is a time to first of all give to God what concerns him more. What concerns him? He wants to be praised. God inhabitus, the praises of Israel. Amen? There's something God just kind of moves in when you stop praising and thanking him. God's concerned about his kingdom. God is concerned about his will. He wants your will to get in line with his will. And if you don't get up in the morning and walk with God, I guarantee you, your will is not going to be in line with God's will. That's why Jesus said, pray this. Say these words. Somebody wrote this, I, and I'm done. I think God is crying out and shouting to us, don't just do something, stand there. Enter into a love relationship with me. Get to know me. Adjust your life to me. Let me love you and reveal myself to you as I work in you. You know, there are Christians that are seeking the will of God, but they're skipping the relationship with God. And the first and the most important thing is your walk with God. That's Numero uno. Amen? Father, please help us to have wisdom and understanding into the will of God. Work in us, Lord, to will and to do of your good pleasure. And, Lord, teach us to do thy will. Not just to know it, Lord, but to do it. Because you're our God. Your Holy Spirit is just so good. Lord, we want our lives tonight to be led into the land of your uprightness. Thy will be done, Lord. And, oh, God, if it, if it may be, thy kingdom come. Maybe even, Lord, tonight. Maybe today, my Lord, you'll come for us. And if it is, oh, how glad. How glad. Even the ones that don't want it, how glad they will be. We'll all be. So come, Lord, soon. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Would you stand, please?